Saint back again with another lesson. This is gonna be a continuation on the uh, the swarthy French or the melanated people of France. They used to populate in rural France. And this little short video, I'm be talking about the real Louis the Fifteenth. Louis the the Fifteenth died in 1774, according to historical records from 1775. He had a swarthy complexion, just like we stated before in many of our other videos, we know what swarthy means. Swarthy means you have to be of a darker melanated complexion. This is not somebody with a tan. This is not somebody with brown hair. This is not somebody with dark eyes or a dark, or a dark, uh, what do you want to say, a tan complexion. You want to say a, a darker white person. That is not what this is. This person was melanated. Louis the 15th. And this is a quote, was the handsomest youth in France. And his complexion was, you know, compared to dark brown or mahogany brown. He's a very dark brown person. And I put up a real pro portrait of it. And they got this portrait of the real Louis the 15th. But today they have it as a portrait of a Negro boy. But we have come to find out this is an actual painting of Louis the 15th because this is one thing that you that makes no sense they have all these paintings of these so-called black so-called melanated people so-called negro people but they are uh, they say they are slaves that this is a random negro boy and what people have to understand and process is that these people they would not spend time because it takes days maybe a week hours at the minimum to paint a picture like this and they're not going to invest money and time for one of their best artists to paint a picture of somebody that didn't mean anything in the society that's a waste of art they would just paint a regular scene a scenery painting of a of the park of downtown they wouldn't go pick out random people to paint because that's that's a waste of money and resources so when somebody tries to tell you oh that ain't him that's just a regular negro no man they're not going to waste money painting somebody melanated for no reason just cause now I'll provide the source of this painting it was done by uh, Maurice Quintano de la Tour in 1751 in 1750 Maurice became the official court painter for Louis the 15th only aristocrat only aristocratic upper families could afford consummated portraits like I said before you couldn't this is very expensive to get painted like this the subject must be notable if a portrait was commissioned Historically, the portrait paintings have prim primarily been memorized by the rich and the powerful, not slaves or servants. A, a painted portrait was often seen as luxury. They were painted for special occasions and important people. In society dominated increasingly by secular leaders and powerful courts, images of altered figures were as means to affirm that the authority and important individuals. Please note that the arts and idealism encourages imagination attempts to realize the mental concept and beauty of a standard perfection and just opposed to naturalism and realism. In the painting, idealism refers to a tradition of creating a perfect figure, one without good looking face, perfect hair, good shape, and no outward blemishes of any kind, and rarely if painted or drawn from life. Essentially, it is an artificial style of painting that bears no re resemblance or no naturalism or character. And that's the paintings that we see today because if you look at a lot of the paintings of these so-called white kings and king queens, nobody really looks like that and you can't find their lineage, you can't find nobody in today that looks like these people. It's like they just made up a drawing. It's a character for Hollywood. That's what we're talking about. In, in the beginning, and, that, and this all started in the beginning of the 19th century when they started to uh, change a lot of these people's faces. 
I'm gonna jump down here. We were also told that his skin was well preserved and it was black. Uh, Louis the Fifteenth is also in good uh, preservation and his skin is black as ink. So they still have his body preserved to this day, and they say, and it's not because of you know, it's not because of just you know dead skin or whatever. His he was a dark skinned melanated man. They they know this. This is a fact, and I'll bring and I'll bring up that source. To be clear, there is no question that the mummified skin can be darkened after exposed to air, but at, at the same time, it so relates to the level of darkness where you end up is depending on where you began. So like like we're saying, so somebody is pale face. And we've seen mummified, they have mummified uh, so-called pale people in China. It's only so dark they're gonna get. They're only gonna get a little, like a little light brown or what we call somebody that is uh, a red bone. But if you are already melanated like me or any other person that is brown to dark brown, and then they pull your mummified body up and you almost like eek, that has to let us know that you were a melanated person when you were alive. It can change, but it only can change that much. That's what this is trying to tell us. Louis the Fifteenth, Louis or Louis the Fifteenth, with a smart or swarthy complexion and prominent nose, were typically bourbon. And that word bourbon comes from the word Berber. That means of people of dark skin descent. Berbers or Barbary or Berber. That's all the same thing. Dark skinned people. Louis the Fifteenth also had a daughter, who was not acknowledged. There was no nun in the a Bobby de Morte and that was supposed to be supposed to be his daughter she was extremely swarthy otherwise resembled him so a lot of times they would uh, kind of write their uh, lineage out of history because this is a time when they were trying to marry into the family or they was trying to replace these people into rulership so they would they would write out these people family out or try to you know try to say that this ain't their family they have a portrait of this random like I said this random dark skinned lady they'd be like oh that ain't his sister that ain't his family but Later on, I'm going to tap into more people into France and we will get all into this history, Casanova and all of them. Some people suspected, not without reason, that a certain lady in the Abbey Morte was Louis' daughter. Like I said, she was very dark and very swarthy. And I provide this uh, source. But France was a very uh, melanated uh, country. It was a very uh, melanated rulership. And I'm going to I'm going to pause it right quick and I'm going to tap into some more of the uh, important rulers and monarchs and artists and different people in France that ruled it that that were important at that time. And just to give a a little background, James II, James Francis Edward, um, Louis, Louis of France, this is not Louis the 15th, this is Louis XIV, so this is Louis the 14th. He's actually uh, the cousin of the Jacobite followers. So this is just to kind of give you another uh, inside uh, detail is that a lot of these, a lot of these uh, Scotland and Scots and British and Wales and France rulers were all related and they were all melanated people, all related and all melanated. Okay, I'm back in it. So now I'm uh, we're gonna talk about this portrait and we're gonna talk about uh, the real Marie Antoinette. 14 years old this portrait is, is you know they're gonna tie that as a young woman but like i said before that we're not investing money and resources because you can only be important to make these type of portraits it was painted by jean and tenny leotard in 1770 in 1770 leotard was commissioned by maria theresa of austria to paint this portrait of her daughter maria antoinette in May 1770, Maria Antoinette became the, the Daphne of France at the age of 14, up until her marriage to Louis the 16th, her apparent to the French throne. She was the last queen of France before the French Revolution. So I'll uh, stop right here. So she was the last melanated queen of France. So just like I told you before, this is around the la- around the end of the melanated rule in France. When they started to, uh, when you hear about all these revolution and wars that was happening in Europe, that's when they started to overturn the melanated, melanated people's rulership. And then you see these white folks today that have just a 100-year monarch. They haven't been going back that far. If they say they're related to these people, it's a lie. Both of these portraits are said to have been painted by Leotard in 1770. However, only one of these portraits was actually painted by Leotard in 1770. The one with the 
virtually invisible brush strokes and beautiful smooth color transition and incredibly realism and intricate detail in regards to the other portrait clearly there is no attempt to accurately depict marie as the character is used marie was 14 years old in 1770 yet she is depicted with a grayish white hair not a wig with a neck and shoulders that would completely be out of proportion flat and analytical and incorrect and we're talking about the lighter version and this is how you can tell like because a lot of these white these a lot of these pale face paintings they don't have the detail or the art or the craftsmanship that these the melanated paintings i'm showing you when you look at these people in melanated you'd be like man why would they put all this detail and these are not paintings or pictures that people are painting today these are paintings that are found in books or found in museums so why is this detail on these melanated people more than it would be on pale face people when it like somebody some kid drew with a crayon marie was cons was not considered beautiful by the standards of today which required a pale complexion blonde hair and blue eyes marie was blessed with the abundance of dark curls and swarthy complexion and brown eyes Marie Antoinette was the great granddaughter, granddaughter of Leopold I, Holy Ro Roman Emperor. The man Leopold I, who bore this heavy weight of ge ge genealogical responsibility, was swarthy, of the middle height, and was projected lower, uh, projecting lower jaw and protruding lower lip, with the traditional mark of the Habsburg. You know, the Habsburg chin, like Charles V, like they had a like their bottom chin was a, a lot bigger. And it wasn't just because of the uh, the beard, but you know, you see a lot of brothers with that, uh, just like you, uh, if you ever watch the uh, Fairly Odd Parents, you hear about the crimson chin. You see a lot of brothers with that big pronounced chin. That's what they're talking about, the Hasbro chin. Not birth defects and all this other stuff they talking about. That's something to try to distort or collude that heritage of those melanated people. The Emperor Charles Charles IV is a middle stature and a good looking plate body. He is a swarthy complexion. The Emperor Charles IV of middle, like I said, and Leopold I was the cousin of Louis the Fourteenth. Louis the Fourteenth, arched eyebrows and eloquent nose and brown complexion. We're also told that the skin was well preserved on his corpse, just like I said. To be clear, there is no question. And this is just talking about what we talked about earlier. But I'm going to show you a picture. And I'm going to put that letter of Marie Antoinette. She was a uh, Daphne, or what do you want to call queen of France. And her last recorded words, 12.15 uh, p.m. October 16th, was a pardonized Mauser. Pause, fed, expires. Pardon me, sir. I did not do it on purpose after accidentally stepping on her executioner's shoe. So if people understand there was a French Revolutionary War and the people that were in power, they executed them or they kicked them out of the rulership and they could not come back to their land. So a lot of the rulership got executed and that's how her rulership ended. You have the uh, France War 1812. Now I put up a picture of her and then I you'll do a comparison to the pale face picture and you'll see one has grave more detail and the other does not. Alright, so we're gonna talk about the real Louis or Louis the 14th. This is right before, you know, Louis the 15th. So Joseph Baron was a French noble, a portrait painting, uh, a muralist, a minimalist, an engraver. He was a successful portrait, you know, a successful artist around this time. And he was the person that had printed, I mean, had painted this portrait of Louis XIV. And it resumed that his career at a conclusion of the French Revolutionary War. So this great artist, even though he was still living after the French Revolutionary War, his career concluded. So this is like, when I'm reading this information, just to give you a kind of a peek into how I look at things when I see the information that lets me know it's a reason why they stopped this first person from painting more pictures this person was painting the art and painting things in that time as they were in true depiction people like that around the 1800s around the 1900s 
they didn't have a job no more because they had to paint these caricatures or these uh iconoclasm and whitewashing all the images from before because they wanted to create this perception that only melanated people were slaves. So he was made a baron and a premier of uh, and a premier of uh, Pentry if I'm pronouncing it wrong so I'm not good in French but he was a baron and he was a prominent person of the town and he drew the last portrait ever made of Louis the Louis the 14th That's a lot here. Louis 16. Louis 16. I'm not Roman. I'm not good with Roman numeral. So if you heard me get it mixed up, who I'm talking about now is the 16th. Louis the 15th, who I was talking about earlier. Sorry for the confusion. Not really that good with Roman numerals. We're gonna get back to it. Both of these portraits are sold to have are said to have been drawn by uh Duke Ducris. However, the only portraits that were actually drawn by this person was circa 1790. It is one that is beautiful and smooth with color transitions. Like I said, you're going to see the difference between one painting and the other. One has a gray more detail and the other one does not. You can obviously tell that one is real and one is one that was painted afterwards. So I'm jump down. Uh, so uh, Louis the uh, 16, he also had a daughter. And we're gonna put up a picture of him and also a picture of his crown. But that's just talk about some more of the uh, rulership and monarchs in France that were uh, melanated. So uh, Louis the 14th, he had a daughter and her name was Louise Marie Teresa, nun of Moret. So she was a, 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 a black nun or a, a Negro nun. <laughs> As like I said, uh, Louis the 14th, he was also melanated because the Louis the 15th and Louis the 16th were also melanated. I put pictures of all these brothers up so you can see this and we all have it sourced up. So you can uh, bring it out to any of the people that you see walking to and fro. Because some of these people might be French. And they need to tap into their history, tap into their story. And one thing why I'm bringing a lot of this stuff out is, it's like I brought out the Irish thing. The reason why I started off with the Irish heritage is because that's part of my 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 story or my, my line and my genealogy. And every so-called black person in America, they have two to three different lines one of those lines is definitely going to be aboriginal what you want to call quote unquote indian to a certain tribe there which might be through your mother or father but another one of those lines which might be multiple is you're going to have one of these lineages going back to either switzerland france ireland great britain because there were melanated people there they got kicked out and enslaved and when they came over here and tried to do their thing colonized it got flipped on their head tops and turf some of them was doing good things, some of them doing bad things. So I don't want to put out here that all melanated people from Europe were uh, just taking advantage of because some of them was out here doing wrong. Some of them was out here pushing the narrative that we see out here today, which I'll get into more, which is the out of Africa. You got black Quakers, which I got some of my some of my family was Quakers from Ireland. So I'm just letting you know that all this is possible and all this is something that could be in your mind. This is your story. This is, this is better than just trying to tell you, hey, you, you was a slave from Africa and I have no proof of your actual family being that. But we can pull out records saying, oh, your, your uh, granddad was a Quaker or he was from, he was a uh, immigrant from France or he was part of the, uh, he was part of the Catawba tribe or he was part of the Shafanta tribe or he was part of, he was part of the, uh, these different tribes. It's easier to find the information. I've never found any information. I've never seen any information that somebody said that their ancestors came off a boat from Africa and they had that documentation. So this is why I'm trying to show people that melanated people were in different places other than Africa so they get these people from other places other than Africa.
so I want to uh, type down this portrait of uh, Louis the uh, 14th daughter. Of this subject must be notable if a portrait was committed. Like I said, if it's historical, it had to be commissioned by somebody that was in high rank of high authority. What do they, what they do to declare that those so-called black pictured in European or arts or slaves or serfs or mythical saints, Maurice, or anything like that? They, like I said, they try to say they're, serf, they're slaves or servants. Another tactic that they use is falsely is that the true meaning of so-called black artwork is to give a false or often derogatory title, stupid, stu stupid lies intended to explain away the presence of so-called blacks in Europe. There are always African slaves, servants, servants. St. Maurice is a good example. When portraits of so-called black nobility are discovered, Euro Eurocentrics conduct the outrageous stupidity scenarios to explain their existence. As like I said, when, a lot of times when I post these videos about the black nobility, it's a lot of white folks, no, that, that's not what Smorthy meant. They were talking about their hair and all of this stuff. But uh, there are white kings, there are pale faced kings and queens, and when they describe them, they describe them a different way. Even when they do have dark hair, they describe their skin and the way they look a totally different way than they describe these people when they say swarthy. So um, that's something that we get away from because now, you know, today, if somebody was the same race as me or looked similar to me, they would just say they were so-called black. But back in the day, they wouldn't say that. They would just say they were uh, dusty, tawny. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't we don't use descriptive words today for race as we did back then. Because you could say brown, but now we're calling the Asian man brown. We're calling the Mexican man brown. And those people are not brown, they're yellow. Only people who are brown or melanated people. People with melanin, Negroid people, African people. People in the Pacific Island, Aboriginal Australians. Those are brown people. So just like I said, that's a Eurocentric type of tactic. To try to say they're either African slaves, and try to push any way that they're not, uh, ab they're not original to Europe. They like to engage in one of their favorite methods of falsifying history, that is to declare all European so-called blacks, Africans, African slaves, and children of African slaves without without the inconvenience of having to prove what they say. So Rego was a, a principal painter with the four generations of the Barbary Berber kings and was commissioned to paint said Barbary king not any fictional character named Saint Bal Balza no mythical Saint Balza that supposedly lived during the time of Christ set for a portrait in 1679 now this let you know this let you know that when they say Saint Balza or they try to say this is Saint Balza or Saint when we show you melanated people that are in Europe, they'll say this is St. Balzar. There is no account of some of these people that they say these are servants or slaves or whatever you want to call it. There's no real account of these people. Another person I'm going to talk about is we're going to talk about uh, the daughter. And bear with me. We're going to uh, also talk. There's another portrait of the daughter of Louis XVI. And just like I said, Maurice was considered a uh, melanated person. And this commission, the painting was commissioned by the same person. Like I said, she was a Daphne of France. And her father was law into throne of France into 1824. Like I said, the French Revolution. Technically, she was the queen of France for 20 minutes on August 2nd, 1830. But between the time of her father's in-law signed an, an instrument of arbitration and the time of her husband reluctantly signing the same document. So she was queen for about two minutes. And I put a picture by her. So I wanted the last thing I'm going to talk about is... um. I was going to talk about is uh, Louis Felipe the first and his wife Maria Amalia of Naples in Sicily. Now, 
Louis Felipe the first, his home is French, so he's a Frenchman. And this painting was commissioned by Dara De La Crox. De La Crox. He was a French Romantic artist regarded from the outset of his career as a leader of the French Romantic School. And both of these portraits of him and his wife, they were painted by, by this man in 1826-1827. Throughout his career as a painter, he was protected by, the, by King Louis Felipe. Maria Amalia of Naples and Sicily was, was a French queen by marriage to Louis Felipe, the King French, the King of France. While in exile, Maria Amalia encountered her future husband, Louis Felipe of or de Orleans. And this is where you get Orleans from. New Orleans. Also forced from his home in France due to political complications to the French Revolution and the rise of Napoleon. So just like I said, they, they were having wars between each other. And these were more wars, or melanated people wars. And they turned into white people capitalizing off of our uh, differences. You had the, like I said, you had the melanated population that was Aboriginal or that was the very first that was in France and Scotland and Wales and that were ruling for a very long time. But then on top of that, you had the other populations that had just came in. You had the Moors that had came in around 1100s or 1000. They would, they had been there for 700 years working their way up as slaves, as workmen, you know, as crop shares. And they finally got some nobility. So they was, they had a standpoint. So they were battling at odds and odds in different countries and also you had uh you had the uh, Ashkenazi Jews or you had pale face you had the Slav you also had them working in there trying to get their standing so you had about three to four different groups of people that had their own agenda in Europe trying to push their way and you see who ended out on top the people that are ruling today the two were married in 1809 three years after they met in Italy whereupon Maria Amelia became the Duchess of Orleans. The ceremony was celebrated by Palermo, Moore, November 25th, 1809. The marriage was considered controversial because she was the niece of Maria Antoinette, while, she, while the son of the man who was considered to have played a part in the execution of her aunt. So she was basically marrying a man that had played a part in the execution of her aunt of the old monarch. Which we just said, we just explained who Maria Antoinette was. Her mother was skeptical to match for the same reason, but she had given her consent after it had after he had convinced her that he was determined to compensate for the mistakes of his father. After having agreed to answer all the questions regarding his father, during the first year of her marriage, Maria Amelia and Louis Felipe lived under the British protection of Paul Paul. Palermo, Palermo, and the palace given to them by her father and Palazzo Orleans. Maria Amelia went to France with her new husband in 1814, where she attempted to make her make a home with her grown family. But with Napoleon's brief return, she was forced to flee yet again. Prior to her husband's rise to power, Maria Amelia and her husband had to cope with the persistent money problem due to the fact that they had no income aside from which they were given by the English crown. The family was given permission to return to France again in 1817. In 1830, following what was known as the July Revolution, Louis Felipe became king of France with Maria Amelia as the queen in July and the July monarch. Um, Maria Amelia did not approve of Louis Felipe's acceptance of the crown and reported and reportedly described it as as a catastrophe, is as a catastrophe, or you know, it was something that was not good. Sorry, I got twisted the tongue. As Queen Maria became foremost known for her for her simple personal lifestyle and her charity work, for political reasons, King Louis Felipe did not wish to have any representation or court life of his more elaborate kind, but rather wished to give the impression of his family living a life that was burglar, burglar class or during his ten, her tenure as queen. The royal court was relatively subdued in its outward appearance. The court etiquette 
of the tur of the turlings was therefore simplified and that the royal family lived a life which was to be modified after the ideal life of a wealth burger wealthy burger class family of the time the few states occasions though they did not regularly host smaller gala dinners for representatives of the people this domestic life did not suit maria amelia who was already devoted or divided to this lifestyle so like what, what i'm trying to explain is that as as king and queen of france they were they were so, so supposed to be accustomed to live in a certain way live in a wealthy lifestyle but that wasn't maria's style because they had been moving to and fro and they really didn't have that much money so she was used to working being charitable she was for the people that's what she was used to doing she wasn't really with all this stuff the husband was doing so they kind of were at odds for that during the revolution in 1848 maria made an attempt to get Louis Felipe to take control of the troops and rally the National Guard to do the riots on the streets and defend his crown with his life. Reportedly, he did not answer her, but only asked her to trust his judgment. When a mob marched towards the Tullers, Louis Felipe was convinced by his ministers to flee, and he signed his abdiction in favor of his grandson against the consent of Maria. So he went against her, not listening to not listen to what she was saying because she was more in tune with the people of France because her family was the was the past ruling monarch of France. So she understood the people and what they was trying what they was going through. And he was not listening to her. And that was his downfall. So we get back. When the family left the palace, Maria reportedly turned the ministers theirs and committed a Osman yet you were not worthy of such a good king. So basically tell him you're not worthy of a good king. The family left under somewhat chaotic circumstances. Maria Amir reported fainting and had to be lifted into her carriage. The family left Paris for St. Cloud and from there they went to Drex, where they parted and made their way to England in different groups. In England, Louis Felipe and Maria were well received by the Queen Victoria, who let them live in Claire and Claremont House for a life. As the French state had decided not to confiscate their property, they did not have money problems. Louis, Louis Felipe died two years later. After the death of her husband, Maria Amelia continued to live in England where she attended daily mass and was well known to Queen Victoria. At her death, she also asked to be called Duchess of Orleans, her gravestone rather than the Queen of, of French. Maria Amelia died March 24th, 1866 at the age of 83. After her death, the dress she had kept since 1848 when her husband left France was put on her according to her last wishes. And that is just to uh, give you a background of the ruling monarch of France and the different melanated monarchs and melanated people of France going back from Napoleon, Napoleon's nephew, and, Napoleon, and all of the Napoleon Bonapartes. A lot of them were melanated people. I showed you that the half of the group came from the East, Central East Africa, over there by Yemen, or what you want to call present day Middle East, Egypt, that area. We all know what those people look like, similar to Ethiopian, similar to what black people in America look like, or how they describe Indians. I showed you Louis the 14th, 15th, 16th. I showed you the daughters. I showed you. Louis Felipe, Maria Emilia, all these people were melanated, and we'll get to more different monarchs of different countries later on, and I might tap into, uh, later on, I know for a fact I'm going to tap into this uh, Pan-African movement, out of Africa movement, I want to get all this European history out the way first, to just so people can get an understanding of what rulerships were melanated, and how long were they melanated? How recent was this? How, how, how old is the information? Because one thing that a lot of people like to do is they'll tell you, oh yeah, you know, blacks ruled Europe a thousand years ago. And they try to push it so far back that man, it must've been so long ago. So it's, you don't, you don't really attach yourself to the history. But what I'm trying to tell you is the reason why we have a lot of European ancestry because it came from these people. These people were fleeing. And that's why I'm unveiling this history, trying to show you. A lot of these monarchs around the 1400, 1500, 1600, 1700, 1800s, they were having a lot of issues. They were having a lot of problems. They had a lot of discord. 
with the uh, with the with the with the monarchs. They had a lot of discord with each other. They had a lot of discord with the new people coming in. They had a lot of discord with the with their uh, servants or with just the world court. Or they had discord with just like the uh, with their citizens, with their people. And this was all caused by different reasons, by caused on their own, by greed. And by them pushing their own agendas, you know, because you had the Holy Royal Empire, they wanted to push where everybody had to be one uh, religion and that everything had to be one way. And you had people that were Muslim in that area, you had people that were Jewish in that area, you had people of different religious and different spiritual sects, and they were all trying to box them in. And so that will that was the biggest downfall of our people in Europe because they had these religious wars. And so-called white people capitalized off of that. But I just wanted to give a, a, a quick breakdown of the uh, history of France. So y'all have a better understanding. And this is your brother PJ the Saint. I want y'all to be safe, be prayed up. Make sure you eat right. Make sure you spend time with your family, learning, listening, and doing your genealogy. If you got questions or anything, man, hit my hit my comments. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. You need my email. Let me know. Anything you need, please comment. Let me know closed mouth don't get fed i'd rather you say something to me ask me a question because it might help me or you it's a lot of people that this information helps or that they might see in it it might help them find something to find their family member or help them turn to the new leaf and new page but it's your brother pj i want y'all to be safe shalom avakabah blessing to you and yours peace be with you